Um, I was I grew up on a farm just south of Cows, over south of the Kankakee River, on the Walter Deardorff farm. I don't know if the name sounds familiar to anybody. Um, and like John's property and stuff, we have found Indian artifacts on and off throughout all the years. And when I I remember finding my first arrowhead, and that was the end of any kind of life, as I would call it. Um, I just dove into history. I love my history. I love Native history. And as I went through college, I became a tax accountant. Because a counselor told me that there was no life as a librarian, and there was no life as a teacher. They weren't going to teach history anymore in schools. That's what I was told. So I became a tax accountant. Well, history still brought me back, okay? And so then I love parks. And you'll find me at the Bailey Homestead, Shellburg Farm, Buckley Homestead. Um, you'll find me at Feast of Hunter's Moon, if anybody's been down there. Um, the Battle of Missinewa, 1812. I've been to Ohio, Michigan, Wisconsin, Kentucky. I just do events. And what I do is I will dress as a captive, a native, captive where I've been adopted into the tribe. Um, so I'm basically a white woman because I got tired of saying, well, you've got blonde hair. How can you be native? So if anybody's interested, I have some pictures. But here's <coughs> basically what I look like when I travel. In sure, to pass room. And here I'm working on the side there. And one of the things when I went to these festivals is that there was a lacking knowledge of food. What did the native people actually raise? How did they come upon the food? Well, there was the hunters, the gatherers, but a lot of the food the women planted. And so when we see corn, we see beans, we see squash, we call those the three sisters, okay? And so I'm going to tell you the story that was given to me, passed out. It's the Iroquois legend of the three sisters. I think so that everybody can hear. I'll go this way with it. This is a story that they use to tell people how corn and beans and squash came to the Iroquois people. Sky Woman, wait a minute, oops, let me go back to here. Okay, it is said that the earth began when Sky Woman lived in the upper world peered through a hole in the sky, and she fell through to the endless sea. The animals saw her coming, and they took the soil from the bottom of the sea and spread it onto the back of the giant turtle to provide a safe place for her to land. This is Turtle Island. This is now what we call North America. Sky Woman had become pregnant before she fell. When she landed, she gave birth to a daughter. When the daughter grew into a young woman, she also became pregnant by the wind. She died while giving birth to the twin boys. Sky Woman buried her daughter in the new earth, and from her grave, three sacred plants, corn, beans, and squash, came to life. These plants provided food for her sons, and later for all humanity, special gifts ensured by the survival of the people given by the great creator. Now, when we talk about explorers in the early um, years, 1700s, this is what I do, 1700s, 1800s, um, I have some accounts that I'd like to share with you about what they saw when they came over. At dawn, the Spaniards marched on through some great fields of corn, beans, and squash, and other vegetables which they had shown on both sides of the road were spread out as far as the eye could see, across two legs of the plain. Among these fields were sprinklings of settlements with houses set apart from each other and not arranged in the order of a town. This is from DeSoto, 1538. Mm 
Okay. Oh, well, this is about how they kind of grown. I'm sorry. Okay. Um, one of the ways that the gardening, I don't, do I have any gardeners here? Any gardeners? Okay. You all grow rows of beans? Used to. Corn, squash. The native people have a different way of growing, okay? I don't know if you can envision, because I don't have a whole lot of pictures here, and I don't know if you can see this, but there's no plows, there's no tillers, and so basically, if you were in the woods, okay, you're going to burn off that wood. And then because you only have primitive tools, you're going to mound dirt up into small hills. And in these hills is where they plant the corn and the beans and the squash. And the reason why they planted the three things together is because the corn supported the beans and the beans provided nitrogen to the ground and the squash protected all that was there. So that's another reason why we have the three sisters. So, um, and then with the gardening and everything like this, um, here at Buckley Homestead I have some gardens that I did. And there's a famous woman, Buffalo woman, who um, we got the most details on her tools. And then here I have some gardens that were done, the Mayans, the Aztecs, and the Incas. So when, you know, after a while, if you want to come up and talk about these and look at the pictures, you're more than welcome. So what I'll do now is, you know, corn, you know, corn is about the oldest. And it comes from South America. And what I'll do is, corn, they think, comes from Tiacente, which is a grass plant. So, I'm going to pass that around. Most of my things you have to kind of just look at because that's the best way of talking about them. So, Tiacente is a grass plant that looks like a corn. I had it. <laughs> <laughs> and a lot of things that were grown by the natives started out as wild. Like here we have pod corn. And the native people call this the grandmother corn because it still has grass like cobs. And yet inside, you're going to see kernels of corn. And if you were to cook this, you have popcorn. You actually do have popcorn. And the reason being is I threw it in the microwave. <laughs> Where did you get these? Um, some of these things were gifts. And some of these things you can find over the internet. Um, there are people who still grow popcorn, seed savers. Um, a lot of my things here were actually gifts. Um, at one point, we <coughs> Okay, I'm tired. You know, I don't want to garden anymore. I did a uh, native ceremony, and in this ceremony, the native leader said, Now you can ask for anything you want, but be careful what you ask for. And so, you know, I was thinking, What do I ask for? And I just said, Okay, I'm going to ask, Should I keep gardening? Should I keep talking to people? Should I still do festivals? And the festival goes on, and then toward the end, a gentleman comes up to me, and he goes, I like what you are doing. He said, thank you. And he goes, I have a gift for you. And he had a bag. You're going to see some of the seeds, some of the corn, some of the beans, and some of the squash. And these were gifts, and he was a native person, he was Cherokee. He became my teacher, and I lost him last year to cancer. So it's going to be very sad. But then, as he had left, and of course I saw him again and again, the other Native leader comes out and he goes, I think I know what you asked for. You got your answer, didn't you? And I said, yes, I think I did. So, now some of the early things, I mean, I know we raised gourds. Everybody's probably raised gourds and stuff. These are wild gourds. 
And some of these gourds will go back about 7,000 years. And actually, you don't think this is edible, but the seeds were edible. Okay? So that's how they started. And so when they found out these were good, they started selecting the seeds. And then as the seeds evolved, here's a bottle of gourd. You're using this as a container. Okay. Um, they became musical instruments. In some of the areas where the bottle gourd does not grow well, and that's usually up in here, because a, a gourd usually needs hot, dry. There's really primitive squashes out there that will harden, and they grow more in cool, wet climates. Now, that bottle gourd, could you eat the seeds from that? There are some varieties. I would not trust myself the bottle gourd. I don't know how. I've never really seen in, in writing um, an actual, yeah, you can eat the seeds to a bottle gourd. Okay. Now I know the wild gourd there I can because the seed oh. is a is a peep up. And it's a little white it looks like a little white squash seed. You know, well, pumpkin but, seeds you can eat. Right? Yes, you can eat pumpkin seeds, right. Yeah. Well then did the, they just use the bottle gourds for putting water in it? Containers, oh, right, container a lot of containers. Oh, Musical okay. instruments, oh, storage bowls for the corn. Okay, and it What's really neat about archaeology, I know everybody's into archaeology, and I know you probably, I don't know if you've done flotation on your site at all, mm -hmm. and what the results are yet, but I suspect they're going to find corn, possibly, um, beans, possibly. Squash seeds they have found, but sometimes they deteriorate a lot. Um, being this area, we might find wild rice, uh, different grasses. Um, this is amaranth. Again, a lot of plants were developed from grassy, what we call weeds. In fact, uh, a, a common weed today that we pull, lamb's quarters, heopodium, that's one of the oldest plants around. And the native people used to raise that for the seeds and make flour out of. So, uh, and you find a lot of chia pods, they call it, in these sites when you find food and stuff like that. Did you ever find uh, signs where they uh, grew uh, like blackberries or strawberries or transplanted mm -hmm. the plants in closer? Yeah, um, actually I have, one little article here I'll share with you, if we can find it here. But anyway, this goes back to 1609, 1619. Champagne, some of the early explorers found where they have brought in strawberries, crab apples, blackberries, strawberries. That's one of the things that you'll find about a native person, is if there's a food or if there's something to be gathered, they'll take it with them. They'll put it in a location that will be better. And that's how basically even corn, you know, they took that teosinte, they take the best seeds, and then they plant that. And that's how you get hybridization, you get things to grow. So yeah, they even adopted peaches, wild plums, they did all those kind of things. Well, I, I knew all that grew wild, but I didn't know if they would, you know, uh, move the plants in closer yes. to their village or the, whatever. The best one, the best one is, them. has anybody heard of Jerusalem artichokes? Okay, we call them sunchokes. They, they're very adaptable. In fact, once you get them going, you can't get rid of them. <laughs> I've brought buckets to a festival and said, would you like some? Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Put them in a spot that you don't care where they grow. Why? And then next year, the year after, Cindy, we can't get rid of them. We weren't supposed to get rid of them, you know. Maybe you're rid of them. Oh, yeah, yeah. There's a lot of work to get that little yeah. inside. Yes. Um, and also you have to be kind of careful. It's also called the gas plant. Can you explain that? I think you guys know. Need them on site. 
But even things like the sunflowers, they grow wild. So many of the sunflowers are domesticated also. I mean, here I don't have the seeds. They've all kind of fallen off, but that's a wild sunflower. Okay, and then from the sunflower we have the Seneca people who developed a sunflower that when you grow, and, and everything has a theory behind it, but they told me that I should plant a striped seed, a black seed, a brown seed, and I think I got a white seed. And as that row is growing, the flowers are big, some are small, some look like wildflowers, and yet that seed stays true. So I've marked it. That plant had the black seed, all the seeds are black. They plant the stripe, all the stripe. Because I've been kind of experimenting with some of that. So the next year, I take those seeds. The black seed stays true, the striped seed stays true, the brown seed stays true. It's, it's very unusual. But they say that's one of the rules, though. You have to plant one of each in your row. But kind of like, um, I've got some things here. I'm going to talk about the native people of Indiana. I thought that might kind of, um, a lot of the seeds were gathered during the break removal, about 1832. And again, this gentleman that I had worked with who gave me seeds, um, I would say he just opened up his treasure chest. And I have been growing this ever since. But out by toward Fort Wayne, Miss Cinema, we had the Miami Indians. And this is the corn that they grew. It's a white flower corn. And I've been maintaining it for about 10 years now. Um, the Potawatomi that were here, they had a white corn. And what's very interesting is that it has only eight rolls. Do I have farmers? What do you do with the other one? All my corn has eight rows. Is that right? Mm -hmm. so you have blue corn, you have red corn, black corn, and the Indian corn basically has eight rows. And you find ten rows. Um, down south you'll get 14 rows, 12 rows. That's more the southwest. That's how you kind of tell the direction the corn came up. That's true. Mm -hmm. But all the archaeology shows that you have uh, eight rows, ten rows. And that was the corn that grew better up in this area. Is that just due to a difference in soils? Um, according to, uh, this is a really good book. I should recommend this book. It's called Plants from the Past. And in back they have sites from Illinois, Indiana, up into New York. And basically, the corn cobs and everything they found in the sites they uh, counted, and like this one site in South Dakota, they found 100 cobs of only 8 row, but 10, 12, 14, 16 were non existent. Um, and this one here, Kansas, now in Kansas, the number of cobs was 100 cobs, that was 10 row. So if anybody, you know, if you start finding anything, you can look here and you can compare sites of Cahokia and compare the different states and stuff that they found on the archaeology sites. Along with the Potawatomis, they grew various beans. This is what they call a cranberry bean, a pinto bean. And I've actually ate all these things. I've cooked, I've made parched corn, um, I made bean flour, these are some of the native what things. What do you have the bay leaves in there for? To keep the bugs out. Oh, okay. Not <laughs> foolproof, but it does I know, help. No, I put them in the cupboard in the mm -hmm. summer. <laughs> yep, it does help. Yeah, it does yeah. help. And the reason why I put Miami Potawatomi because they were kind of a shared bean. You'll find a lot of groups will have um, shared beans. And the Potawatomi had a lima bean. And some of these, if you look, you're not going to find them in a store. 
And you might find them in a seed savers catalog, but even some of those I haven't even found. That's where I was wondering where you found them. <laughs> well, some of these have been gifts. Some of these have been gifts that I don't, they were family. And sometimes the people will tell you that it's from family. Yeah. Um, they're not real green. But now I have found in my research down in Florida, there's a butter bean very similar to this in Florida. So they're very different. And then we have, well here I'll show you, this is a perfect example. This is a very rare bean, and it's called Sister Hannah. Don't know anything about Sister Hannah? Except when I've done research, it is from the Delaware people. And obviously Hannah was a Delaware. And her beans are very there's solid ones, there's some striped ones. And I guess when I grew this also, you get solid beans, you get striped beans. And when somebody asks, well, what's the history? I said, it's Sister Hannah's bean. That's all I know about it. Is there a particular reason mother in Assisia? Well, when I do historical reenactments, I can't use anything modern. I have oh. to be 18th century. Okay. <laughs> so when I have this display out, of course, I don't have these pictures or anything. How do you know that from the 18th century? Huh? How do you know that shells from the 18th century? Because the trade routes, the trade routes were immense. And so I could have shells from the sea because they were probably traded on the trade route. This one I think is very interesting. This is called Shawnee. This is from Ohio. And it's white corn. And it's a flower corn. But it's got blue kernels and it's got speckled corn. And some of it, there is also Shawnee red copper corn. And that is a very, very pretty red corn. Is all the kernels the same in the dark, dark red? Pardon? The, the shiny, no, not that one, but the, oh. dark, the dark, dark red one you just talked about. It actually looks copper. I mean, it kind of looks like a copper red. Pretty and, kind of red. Huh? Pretty it, kind of red. Well, it's, it, it's, it's hard to describe. They call it copper red, okay? And it, and it's, it kind of looks red. Now, fluorescence is going to look really red, but if you put it outside, it's going to look kind of orange. And, and then they gave the name copper to it. So. Now sweet corn, that came very, very late, about the 1700s, and basically it was a mutant of some of the flint and flower corns. And when the native people found this kernel that was sweet, they started saving this kernel. That's how we have sweet corn today. And we know sweet corn white, yellow, but sweet corn was actually black. Some of the oldest was black, coming from the blue flint corn. Some of the sweet corn the Mandans had was red. So you do have uh, various different colors of sweet corn. But what's interesting is when you pick it young, it's white. It looks white, and then it dries into these different colors. Now here's a bean that you can find today's market. It's called the Scarlet Runner. And, but the Seneca people call it a bear bean. And I also have a bean called a rabbit bean. And so I got smart one time, and I had another friend. In fact, you guys probably know her, grandmother, Babe Goff, OK? And I asked her, I said, OK, why am I calling this a rabbit bean? Because she gave me that bean. And I go, why is this a bear bean? And she kind of looked at me, and she goes, Sydney, now come on. What? You cook a rabbit, you cook a bear with those beans. I said, okay. So if you see uh, anything like a bear bean or something, you know that if you're going to cook it, use bear meat. And then for rabbit, now I've used venison. I thought it's pretty good. But um, Babe, when I was in a reenactment with her, she would only use it with rabbit because she raised rabbits. And so. Uh, <laughs> So I learned a few lessons, you know. And they also grew um, some sacred plants. They grew tobacco. They grew their sage. Um, I'm going to ask everybody if they know what this is. I forget what the name of that is. 
Or snail, we call them. Yeah. Yeah. It really is. Yeah. Scouring rush. Okay. And when it dries, what's it feel like? Well, if you're ever traveling and um, you forget your toothbrush, you can brush your teeth. It has been known for the native people to to rub the plaque off your teeth with this. And also, they would sand gourds. I mean, if you had a gourd with a rib and everything, you use that as sandpaper. And actually, um, what happens with this is uh, the pioneers adapted it and they used it for scrubbing their pots and pans with it. And also, I was watching um, a PBS station and uh, there was a person restoring an old church. And no matter what he sanded, no matter what materials he used, he could not match this one piece that he was trying to match. And all of a sudden it dawned on 18th century he went and used this, and he got a perfect match because the carpenters back then were using this as their sandpaper. So they got an actual finish. Is there some of this around here or something? Oh, somewhere? it's all over. Yeah, the yeah. 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 yeah, it's all over. Yeah, it's all over. It's all over. It's all over. Yeah, it's all over. And of course, you know, we would to preserve food, we would dry it. These are dried beans. And of course, the pioneers started calling them leather bridges. So, and I, I've actually cooked it, it. What you have to do is get used to the texture. Everything was dried back then. So you're doing a lot of chewing when you cook dried foods. <laughs> <laughs> they didn't shell them? Well, they did. They also did that, but they also kept a certain amount of, um, actually even some of the corn. If the native people didn't have sweet corn, they would take corn, what they call, in the green stage. They'd cut it off the cob, and then they would cook that, and then they would dry it. And that's the only way we had to preserve food. Everything had to be dry. Mm -hmm. and we even used um, squash boss blossoms. And that actually will thicken <coughs> soups. If you cook a soup and you want to thicken it, because we didn't have wheat flour, you would take your squash blossoms and you were thinking your soup. Well, yeah, now in the stores you could buy uh, dried fruit mm -hmm. packages. Right, mm-hmm. And I was very lucky, my pumpkins are still good. <laughs> <laughs> this is my pumpkin from October. And also in the, um, has anybody raised the kushas? Those, I, I like those kushas, I like to eat them and stuff, but they have found the, the kusha going back to the Cahokia site. And they have this dated clear back before 1500s. What is that? The kusha? Yeah, it, it's um, like a great big, huge green and white squash. So this is a very old, old squash. For the squash family, huh? Mm-hmm. And of course, like some of my you know, beans will have stories. I don't know if we've heard of the Anasazi beans. Found that in southwest in a cave. Some archaeologists will say, no, nah, it's a story. Some people will say, yeah, it was found in the cave. But what happened is this bean was found, and nobody did a study or documentation, so it's kind of hard to claim that it might have been raised by the Anasazi. But the name has stuck. And I have several <laughs> seeds here. Actually, what I'm going to do is just have you know, people come up or questions and later on look. I'm, I have several seeds um, raised by the Mandans or Ripperas. Um, and actually here that were collected on the Lewis and Clark expedition. And this one everybody should recognize. Now this one you're going to find in the stores. Oh, Navy beans, northern beans. The northern beans. These are from the Mandan Indians. Mm -hmm. Brought back by Lewis and Clark and given to Thomas Jefferson. Mm -hmm. <laughs> And so that's one of the beans we still use today. So, oh, I should probably go over my tools, right? Okay, so with corn coming up, they're going to be raising agricultural squashes a couple thousand years up in South America. So 
I would say as soon as the women decide instead of gathering, you know, probably after the Ice Age and stuff, you know, you're going to have the, where all the hunters and stuff, but then as the plants were coming, they were gathering the seeds, and, and they realized, well, hey, if we take some of these weeds out, and we use these plants, we get more of the crop. Just like if you want more raspberries or blackberries, you're going to clear out the unwanted plants. So thousands of years. I would say thousands of years. They have in Southwest, they found canals where they actually watered the gardens in the Southwest. Chaco Canyon and stuff, they have found, they have found the canals where they ran water out of the mountains. I have a question. Sure. Um, you and other people who are, are seed savers, you get these ancient seeds mm -hmm. and you plant them and then you have a, a crop and you have more of these ancient seeds. How do you keep their integrity? How do you know they're not hybriding with other things? How do you, how are you sure that each crop is still this original seed? Yeah. Well, in, in studying um, the beans and stuff, there's certain beans you can plant next to each other, like a lima bean will not cross with another kind of a kidney bean, okay? But now corn, that is difficult. I cannot grow corn every year. Now I'm very lucky I've got Nipsco on one side of me. And then if my father plants corn around the house, I can't grow corn. But if he's got soybeans all around me, that's the year I raise corn. Now sometimes, I, like I mean, sweet corn and stuff, that's a real early one. So I plant my flint corn, and then I go behind the house. It's all barriers, it's basically barriers. And then I will plant the sweet corn later when my other corn is like about that high. Because now it's gonna pollinate and everything before my sweet corn, you know, will get to that stage. So a lot of it's timing, a lot of it's timing. And then knowing what you can plant next to each other. Like I only raise one sunflower at a time. I've got like four or five sunflowers, but each year is just one variety. And so I always look on my shelf, okay, three years, four years, okay, this is the one I'm gonna raise this year. Um, this is only a fraction of my collection. Um, and sometimes when I've gotten gifts, I've only gotten seven seeds. It seems to be a very magical number for the natives. They will give you seven seeds. And so sometimes it takes me a while to raise a crop, and then I'll share it with other people and stuff like that. So, and then, like I said, I will look on my shelf. I have dates in all my jars. And then as it's getting really old, that's when I raise it out. And how long will your seeds Say, do you, do you know? Beans can stay the longest. I have them in a dark basement. Sometimes you can put them in the freezer. Then you know they, they're frozen for a long time. Beans I raise like I don't let them get any older than five years. Corn I try three to five years, but then I can tell if I got something really old, it's just gone. It's just gone. If, uh, actually, I have this one story. I think. This is really kind of neat on this one corn, if I can find where he went. This is a very old corn, and I don't think it's going to grow anymore for me. But this was the cob. It's from southern Illinois, and around the Cahokia area. And it's a white flint with some blue specks. And I planted it, had a decent crop. I had the next year and had a drought and I couldn't get water to it. I decided to plant way out by the river. And that was a mistake because I couldn't, where I planted it, I could not get water to it. But it like saved, I mean this were, these were the cobs. And each of these cobs have a coating, almost like the pod corn, has a covering of a husk. And then here, here's another. These were the cobs that I got from the drought. And uh, again, John told me, well, plant it. I had a good year. I got this again. <laughs> so some of the older varieties like that, I think they tell stories to you. They really do. Ex you know, experiences and stuff like that. I have no reason why that would, you know, go from one form to another, except I had a drop one year. So I thought that was kind of interesting, too. I have to laugh because my dad, I told him, Dad, I got a new seed. He's looking at me like, oh no, go ahead. 
go away, go away. I don't want to see any more seeds. Because, <laughs> see, he always has to do the work. No, but he doesn't. I always say, Dad, can I have a new patch out in the garden? You know, can I have a new place out in the field? He goes, oh, are you ready to give this up? I, said, well, I can't. I can't. <laughs> So, oh, here's some of the tools. Let's get into some of the tools here. Okay, how does the guy can figure this one out? Right. Right. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's a rake. By putting just the willows together. And then each willow is tied apart. I could probably have another willow coming up here too if I want. But sometimes when I go to a historical site, I'll actually use this because uh, I have to get where I put my bed and stuff. I'll take the branches and the leaves and stuff off. And so all my tools are used. And then of course here, deer antler. Like a cultivator? Oh. And like another rake, tiller, like a tiller, if I was going to till. And even some of the um, hose, this is made out of a deer shoulder bone. Now, my poor buffalo hoe had an accident this morning. Oh. <laughs> um, again, these holes were used for dirt. So when it landed on cement, it didn't do too well. <laughs> so I will go and I'll get another buffalo hoe. But basically, this is how. Now, if you can see how it's attached. Is that from a buffalo shoulder blade mm -hmm. or something like that? Mm-hmm. Mm -hmm. uh -huh. And that's one of the reasons why they did the mound uh, system when they were uh, planting is because, again, we don't have the tillers, we don't have the plow. In fact, a lot of, if you ask a native person, if they garden, they'll still do it the old way because they feel a plow rips open the mother earth and we're doing damage, and we're hurting her. So a lot of them won't use tillers. A lot of them won't use the plows. Um, and that's what upset them with the pioneers coming over. Not so much we were also taking the land, but you're hurting Mother Earth. You're ripping her open. So um, you'll find a lot of stories going back where they were upset about the tractors and stuff because of the way we were ripping open Mother Earth. And of course, when the native women had the voyagers and the early explorers bring us the metal hose, oh, life changed for us. Our gardens got bigger, okay, easier to plant. And basically, if you got an old hole, this is a reproduction of an 18th century hole. How did that stay on there? They put it on from the small part and um, actually, um, it went, you know, over here, this is just yeah. narrow enough, uh -huh. and kind of wiggled it, and wiggled it until it stayed. Yeah, now sometimes I've had it where this will become so dry, I'll have to get a new one, because it's almost to the end. When I started, I had this much wood, mm -hmm. but as it dries and everything, this will, in fact, you'll see a perfect case with this one. Now, this hoe... They actually use this. Um, they would trade this. This is actually from a pioneer who would use this to build log cabins. This is actually a wood chipper. And they're making the logs and everything. But I liked it so well, I traded for it and uh, I made a hole out of it. But you can see where it's loose. Mm -hmm. And eventually, I'm, not, I'm gonna have to get another um, stick for it. And of course, some of the old holes that they find in the archaeology. This would be a stone hole. You'll find a lot, a lot of stone holes. This is probably, you know, some things may you know, deteriorate away and stuff, but the stone holes, we know, will stay at the sites and everything like that. And this is rather a small one, a very primitive one. Some of them get really fancy with the chert. You'll see red ones, black ones, and you'll see them this big on some of the sites. They also made holes out of shell. And that one, I, 
But when I was in a museum down in southern India, Angel Mounds, I don't know if anybody's been to Angel Mounds. Shell is very, very thick. It's like a clam shell. So they actually would take a, make a hole out of clam shell. And they would actually hole with that. So I'm going to open it up to you guys. You know, you got any questions? If uh, you want me to talk about a certain um, item or come up and see some more seeds. Uh, I have some books. I even have pictures here of what the native people looked like in Indiana in the 1800s. These were done by um, the artist George Winter. I guess I have a question. Mm -hmm. So what, did they have different kinds of meals for breakfast? And Actually, you'll find they didn't have breakfast. They didn't have lunch. The women kept a pot of something on the fire all day. And if the man was hungry, if the kids were hungry, he just helped yourself. It gets a little annoying when you do it at a festival, but <laughs> <laughs> but actually from the time I get up in the morning, I will start cooking, and I will constantly be cooking something in a pot on the ground. I mean, I've done parched corn, I've done um, husk bread, I boil bread, I do. But yeah, they always had food cooking all day. They didn't really, they had ceremonies where they would all gather and have prayers and blessings, and then they would have a community meal. But a lot of times, everyday life, you know, it's just like us. Sometimes some people like, you might like to eat breakfast at 8. You might want just coffee and then a donut at 10. So basically, you just, when you were hungry, you ate something. And if you were on the road, you had jerky, you had parched corn, you had dried fruit, all in a little bag. Especially if you were hunting, if you were at war, they just had little bags where they had just enough food for a couple of days. I understand that the, uh, the Cherokee Indians came up from North Carolina and uh, through Indiana, Illinois, up into Minnesota and Wisconsin, uh, and did a lot of farming. Did you, did you ever find any other tools or any signs of them? Um, I never he heard the Cherokee coming that far north. I know they were into Kentucky. Uh, now you got the Cheyenne up there. I've read where you have the Cheyenne up in this Minnesota. Actually, Cheyenne were farmers. They raised corn at one time until they started becoming the plain, when they were pushing, when all the tribes were being pushed out west. And then they became the buffalo hunters and everything. And they actually gave up their farming techniques. The Cheyenne were great farmers at one point in Minnesota and the upper parts of Wisconsin. So but I didn't hear about the Cherokee being up there. Yeah, I heard they were, <clears throat> a lot of them came up in this area. Uh, then later on I heard that they also went up in the Minnesota and Wisconsin. A lot of them settled up there. Were, yeah. uh, well, the with the Great Push and the Indian removals, you know, you know, I'm sure that some groups were scattered and, yeah. and did everything. Well, I imagine they went up to Minnesota and Wisconsin because of all the lakes and that and fishing. Mm -hmm. and, and settled and become farmers and that. Right, yeah. So I, like I said, I get always more and more fascinating and everybody has a new seed for me. I just get thrilled. <laughs> <clears throat> you know if wild rice was ever cultivated in this area? Oh yeah. There's a uh, Kankakee marshland. Mm -hmm. Yeah, um, I've got, I don't have it with me. Like I said, I've got so many books and stuff, but I do have a map of some of the wild rice um, patches or marshes where the LaSalle and everything has marked wild rice areas. So yes. I go to northern Minnesota quite a bit. I'm always bringing wild rice back mm -hmm. home. Yeah, but if you, Indiana Dunes, if you come to Long Beach, um, what's the other uh, beach out there? But right below the beach, you will see this great big circle and it'll say rice field. So Indiana did have a lot of rice fields. Mm -hmm. The, uh, the one thing Mark was going to talk one time, and of course when somebody asked a question along those lines, and he said, yeah, we come up with this one, and I know where he's talking. We came up with this one stuff, we're not quite sure what it is, but we think, and then he shouted out to me, he said, was there rice down there? And I, yeah, yeah, historically, mm -hmm. right? He said, that's what they found. Mm -hmm. Yeah, my dad has a, a farm toward the dairy, they call it the Blue Sea area, because it was another waterway. 
And uh, if the ditch is full enough, of course, now they dredged it. Of course, Dad did tell me a little bit. I think there was wild rice growing in that ditch. <laughs> I said, is it there now? Well, no, they dredged it. It's like, oh. So you'll find Blue Sea, Madera, Valeria, all the great marshes. Yeah. Well, doesn't rice take a lot of water? Yeah. That's probably why it was up around the lake. Yeah, and it's really, it, you know, it's not a rice plant, it's a grass plant. Right. It's not a grass plant. Yeah. Misnamed by, you know, like the same way with Jerusalem artichokes. We call it sunchokes, it's a sunflower. It has nothing to do with Jerusalem and it's not really an artichoke. But by the time it got to Europe and the Italians got it, it came back and we have Jerusalem artichoke out of it, you know. <laughs> so, you know, same way with the tomato. The tomato was not always edible. People thought you would die if you ate a raw tomato. In fact, Jefferson, I thought it was kind of cute in his diaries, he goes, I raised the tomatoes. They're very, very pretty, and I watched it all summer long. He never ate a tomato in his lifetime. Thomas Jefferson. No. In, in the potato, when they brought the potato over to Europe, it took a long time, and then what happened was, I think one of the kings or one of the princes cooked it in milk. And after it was cooked in milk, he served it to the servants, and they thought they had better eat it because the king was eating it. And that's how the potato got going in Europe. So some of these foods weren't accepted at first. And of course, then when the tomato, like the tomato, okay, we'll cook it to death. That's how we get tomato sauce and tomato juice. That's the only way people would eat it there for a while. You have to cook it first. So, and then, of course, we, eat it. we know we know different now. We can eat it raw, cooked, dried, you know, kind of thing. Probably somebody ate a tomato and, for some other reason, died. And it well, they saw the native people, and they're like, you're crazy. But they're I, alive. I read once where they, they wouldn't eat tomatoes and have milk with it. They was afraid if they had milk and mm -hmm. tomatoes together, it would kill them. Yeah, yeah. There's there's a lot of it's kind of fun to watch some of or read some of the colonial taboos and stuff like that. So. You were talking about the Indiana Jones and the water. It's in some of them back ponds where you where rice was at. Mm -hmm. Some of that water is over two thousand years old. Mm -hmm. And there is uh, six kinds of cactus, and there's eight kinds of orchids. There. You can't go back in there where they're at because mm -hmm. the park rangers know where they're at. Right, right. But there is priority cactus. There are six other types of cactus and there's five different types of um, orchids mm -hmm. in there. Yeah, I, I have an article, again, it's probably, I don't have it with me, about um, the Indiana orchid. Mm -hmm. And uh, it's blue, it's kind of like a blue lavender. I have a drawing the early documentations of the Indiana orchid. Um, some of the cactus, in fact, you do find, I call it a little pear cactus. It's got little yellow flowers and stuff like that. There's See yellow, the, white, and there's kind of a pinkish one. Mm -hmm. Yeah, now the yellow one you find a lot around the railroad tracks and stuff like that. And very, very old cemeteries. Where I go to church, the cemetery there goes back to the 1800s. There is those little cactuses all over it. And they survive the winter, they survive all the rain, and, yeah. yeah. The food that you cook, so you get the seeds and grow it and cook it. How do you know how to cook it? How do I know how to cook it? Actually, some of, some of it was written in a lot of the early journals and stuff like that. Actually, green beans and stuff. You know how we eat them when they're real young? We like them really tender and stuff. A lot of the natives waited until they got really plump. Like, um, uh, I was told at one point that this bean was not, you know, edible. You know, it, well, it was edible in this stage. You know, it was a, it was a dry bean, but you, you shouldn't eat the green pot. And I'm like, I was freaking everybody out because <laughs> I ate the green pot, you know. And I said, well, you should be able to eat it. But what they did was they let the green pods fill out, and um, you will read where they would take it and they would just like suck the beans out and throw the pods away. 
because you'll know, now there's one thing, if you raise heirloom seeds, a true native bean, if it, they say it's bush, that bush bean had better have little runners going up. Because if it doesn't have little runners and if it doesn't have strings, it's not a true native. Um, there's a bean they call Pawnee, and it's just been named Pawnee. It's not a native because these beans, if they're old enough, they're going to have strings. We have hybridized that string off the beans. So when you raise your yellow beans and green beans, you're not going to have the string. All these beans, I have to take all the string off of them. And they have little runners going up the corn poles, the socks and everything. Um, and then you'll have your pole beans also. But even the bush beans have little runners on it. And that's how you know you have a true um, a native bean. The corn, again, if it's eight rows and ten rows, you're going to know that you have a native corn. The squashes, um, your zucchini is a newer variety, but your yellow crookneck is an Indian, your white scallops are Native American, your kushas, your pumpkins. Even though this is a sugar variety, a later variety, um, it is descended from what they call the Omaha pumpkin, which is oblong and very old. I was watching a uh, golf over the weekend. It's going from uh, to Arizona. And uh, they showed this cactus. They built a new golf course out in the middle of the desert. This cactus, you know, seemed like, like the arms. A little bit. And uh, they said that cactus is rare. And uh, the middle age of uh, the cactus is 1,500 years. Mm -hmm. And it's the only place that that particular kind of cactus grows. But what amazed me was middle age, 1,500 years. Mm -hmm. yeah. and of course, if you get caught touching it, you're going to jail. But, right, uh, right. It's amazing that it can survive. We've lost that a lot of them because the kids and stuff will go and shoot at them and stuff yeah. like that. And they're full of bullets and everything like that. So a lot of them did get lost. That's why they're very, very protected. They're so old. It takes a long time for one to grow. Yeah, but I was surprised that one. Because mm -hmm. you see a lot of movies that are showing right. on the background or something right. like that. Right. For uh, affecting yeah. everything. Yeah. Yeah, and they say they only grow in that one particular area. And it takes that long for it to mature. Right. Yeah. And so that's amazing. Yeah. And, and also, some of the foods that were adapted to, like the Voyagers brought over peas. Well, peas were European, but they were so similar in growth to beans that a lot of the native people adapted peas, um, like I said, anything sweet. In fact, um, Marquette in 1679, and this is right around northern Illinois in Indiana, he was very thirsty. He sat down under a tree and the native person gave him a watermelon of red seeds. And this is in his documentation. And uh, the day that uh, my good friend gave me the watermelon with red seeds. I kind of sat down for a few minutes because I did not realize that it still existed. Hmm. Yeah, that, did, they, did they find a lot of watermelon seeds with the Indians? Yes. They? They, the, they say the watermelon came over the Spanish people. Now, when they're wet, they're they're red. They're really dark pink kind of red. When it's dry, they're really pale. Uh, mm -hmm. Did a watermelon originally come from Spain? They say Africa. Oh, Africa. Africa. Um, yeah. But anything sweet, melons, sweet, the native people like sweet. That's why they did maple sugaring and everything. And so you'll find that very early the watermelon was over here. So they figured from Florida in the 1500s, if Marquette up here around the Great Lakes recorded in 1679, you're talking about 150 years, 175 years traveling from Florida. That's how extensive the trade routes were. The birds spread. <laughs> are the, are the uh, Native Americans, do they use any seasonings at all when they cook? Yeah, yeah, it's not really plain food. In fact, um, there's herbs called colt's foot that if you burn it and the ashes are like salt, um, they, use, they would burn corn cobs. And, like some of the corn was made into hominy. So in order to make hominy, you have to get the outer shell of corn off. And so they would use the ashes of uh, the wood, or um, so 
like a light, and a sassafras, the leaves again were burned, um, and they would make like a seasoning. Maple sugar was the seasoning. They would trade for salt down in Arkansas, where the salt caves are, in Kentucky, the salt caves. So they would trade for a little bit of salt and stuff like that. Was salt extensively traded around? Like you find references to salt. And of course then, too, the French were here as early as 1600. So they were bringing in pepper, cayenne pepper, especially cayenne pepper. And then with the seeds, the native people started growing their own cayenne pepper. Cayenne pepper is like the earliest um, seasoning that you will find. So I don't really carry like black pepper off. I have browned up cayenne pepper in my, in my seasoning and stuff like that. Maple sugaring um, and other plants too. Um, I can't think of them, but like the squash blossoms and stuff, will, they will flavor, they will thicken the soup. Sweet corn, sometimes dry sweet corn was thrown into the pot because it made it sweeter. Um, I make a cornbread, and the, the original cornbread, okay, we have bean soup and we have cornbread. The original cornbread recipe, the beans were cooked, mashed, now we didn't have flour, so then the cornmeal was mixed into this bean mash until you made patties, and then you fried your cornbread. So the beans and the corn were together in the original um, cornbread, and then you would put a venison broth on top of that. Some people say, is that good? <laughs> Some things you have to acquire the taste for. Well, the talk about sweet that you find a lot of uh, rhubarb. No, rhubarb is, no. no, that's European. That's European. That came from Europe? Mm-hmm. But I mean, on the Indians, you didn't find much uh, rhubarb? Mm-mm, no. Well, that's asparagus. There's a, there's a wild asparagus, but I don't know how, I haven't seen a whole lot of reference to that being used. So I don't know. Yeah. But I tell you, they, they did milkweed pots. I mean, if you get a milkweed pot about that big and you boil it, and then you would throw the water out. You boil it again, throw the water out, boil it again, and then you can eat it. So some things, poke berries, the poke, the poke salad and stuff like that, they would boil and boil acorns. They boil and boil, and they throw the water out. And say that's all the poisons, that's all the lye, that's all the leaching and stuff and that. And then it becomes edible. It becomes edible. How about the, the oh. yucca plant today? Yeah. Out Southwest yeah, they yeah. had the yucca plant. And there was things called camas. There was there's there's a lot of wild plants that uh, they were using. In fact, uh, yeah, this whole book really good. here okay. talks about documentations of all the plants and stuff that uh, they had here. Um, the wild plums, the cranberries, um, penny royal, partridge berries, nanny berries. There's things here, even the nettle, stinging, stinging nettle, they would boil that. Um, wild lettuce has those little sharp thongs and stuff. You would boil that and that, that comes off. Um, Elders, uh, flowers, columbines, honeysuckles. I mean, this book just has all kinds of things. But I wouldn't run out and just kind of like <laughs> pick a plant. And <laughs> <laughs> How about fertilizing? Fertilizing? Today. You'll find that a lot. Fish <coughs> story really, they kind of dissuade putting the fish in the mouth and stuff. That was a story that got going at some point. But a lot of times they planted, well, the burning. If you burn, that would leave some of the nutrients and stuff in the ground. But they would farm an area five, seven years, and they would move the whole village into a new area. And then nature would just replenish on its own. You'll find a lot of references where, oh, we're going to move the camp because the soil is no good. I was told. Go ahead. I was told that if you find ginseng, the French brought the ginseng over. Well, there's foreign ginseng and there is American ginseng, so I don't know. Um, I don't know which variety they might have brought over, because there is an American ginseng. I found some. Mm -hmm. And there's wild ginger. 
I don't know the difference between wild ginger. Maybe you have wild ginger if you found it around, find it locally here? Yeah, I might, I might was. You might have wild ginger. I don't know. Does the red smell like ginger? <laughs> no? Okay. No, I, I, I pulled it out. It looked just like It might ginger. be. Yeah, you might have the American version, though. It was uh, mixed in with uh, May apples. Those May apples? Yeah, it's in the same spot. Yeah. A lot of May apples and then yeah. some of this. Yeah, May apples are edible, a little apples. <laughs> the, um, a couple things. When you brought up tree, we came up with a couple of pieces of, of obsidian at the lodge site, and so that was mm -hmm. inside Yellowstone. So mm -hmm. there was extensive tree. Oh yes, foods, you know, and even the native people would raise corn and stuff just for the forts in the area, in Fort Detroit, all the forts and stuff. A lot of times they expanded the fields for the trade, the furs. But you see a lot of references to 100 bushels of corn went into the fort. You know, baskets of beans went into the fort. So not only fur trade, but there was a lot of food trade done to the natives locally. At Fort Wayne and stuff, I got references to the white corn coming into the fort. And then I have a reference um, to a Frenchman getting lost in the Huron cornfields. He took the wrong turn, and he was stuck in the cornfields for two weeks. And then he survived, because in the morning, the water was collecting on the corn leaves, and he ate some of the green corn right off the cob. And also, the corn, if you chew on the stalk, will also give you water, because there was no dew on the leaves and stuff. But finally, he managed to get himself out of the cornfield to the fort. But every direction he came, he was lost in the massive cornfield at the wow. Hurons. The Hurons were really big corn growers. Acres and acres of corn. <laughs> so like I said, you're more than welcome to come up and uh, like I said, because back from where you guys are, you can't see where the, um, at the time the explorers came to South America, you can see their tools and the drawings, um, the different holes and everything. And here's the village, Iroquois village, with the, the, the gardens, eating the food, planting. Here's a, from uh, 1738, planting of the corn. Here's the buffalo bird woman. This is, she was documented at the turn of the century. You can see where she's drying pumpkin, where they're growing <coughs> corn. Here's some of the first plants, sumpweed, chia pod, little barley, knotweed, may grass, the sunflower. And here's, this picture here is where I grew my tia I actually, it never, never got seed out of it, but I got the, I got, it looks just like a corn plant here. Okay. And then here's the squash and the gourds. Here's some other historical gardens. And then here's pictures of a garden I did at Buckley Homestead. So you're more than welcome to come up and take a look or look at some of in these books here. I've got pictures of corn that's actually stored in museums. Pictures of the socks, the fox. Um, some of the corns that they had gathered at the turn of the century, 1900, 1910. They're black and white. These were printed off before I got a color printer. Some of the tools. Um, deer jawbone was used for cutting corn off the cob. Um, corn husks were used to make bags, cooking. But my problem is I know so much, and to get all the information out, <laughs> So if you have any other questions or anything, just let me know. Well, I want to thank you, Cindy, for coming out. And, uh